Hello, everybody. Welcome to Spiritual Awakenings International Presents to our uh, very special um, Veterans Day Remembrance Day presentation. So uh, I'd like to say on behalf of everyone in uh, Spiritual Awakenings International, hello, bonjour, uh, willkommen, hola, buenos dias, buongiorno, and bon dia. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's an honor and a privilege to introduce Reverend John Price. Reverend Price's impressive credentials are on the SAI website, but I'd like to emphasize a few of note. Reverend John W. Price retired in 2004 after 32 years in parish ministry in Texas, but he's still serving as an assisting priest at an Episcopal church in Houston, Texas. Reverend Price was ordained as a chaplain at a rank of 1LT for the Texas National Guard in 1965 and retired as the state area command chaplain with the rank of colonel in 1995, and that was 30 years of service. His pastoral counsel to the U.S. military members gave them some relief that they were perfectly normal but had been blessed with some type of STE. Uh, Reverend Price is author of the outstanding book, Revealing Heaven, The Christian Case for Near-Death Experiences. Folks, Revealing Heaven is a highly recommended book for anyone interested either in heaven or near-death experiences. Revealing Heaven is a powerful and exceptionally well-written book sizzling with insights that are both informative and profoundly inspirational. Now, near the beginning of Reverend Price's career, he began hearing about STEs, and he sought more information. He discovered my website, the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, and the endearth.org website we have shares, Reverend Price came across the endearth website by asking the critical question, well, what about a soldier? How does God, the creator, review someone that has to kill for their country? There was a profound email dialogue on this issue on the Enderf website with an nde -er who experienced an awesome NDE where he was able to return with knowledge gained from the other side. As a result of this exchange, Reverend John consented to support the Enderf website by answering questions on their website for others to benefit and grow from, from his remarkable and special area of expertise. Also, I'm delighted to share that Reverend Price today will be spending some time discussing the important topic of this being Veterans Day in the United States and what it means to him personally. We are very much honored to have Reverend Price uh, share more today on the matter of military service members who have STEs. Reverend Price, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Jeff, I greatly appreciate the help you've given me over the years and uh, our friendship with you and Jody. Um, gracious, that's a nice introduction. Um, you would have thought I wrote it, but no, Jeff wrote it, which tells you how well uh, he's familiar with me and my work. I owe a lot of it to Jeff and Jody because in the conversations that he mentioned that I had with, um, with them on the Endorf uh, website, why I picked up uh, lots of accounts, some of which you'll hear this evening. Um, it's Veterans Day. Um, it's called uh, Remembrance Day in, in, in British territories, <clears throat> but I'm old enough to remember when it was referred to as Armistice Day in this country until that was changed. <clears throat> Jesus said, like greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friends. Mentioned that in the Gospel of John. Now, I want everyone to realize that laying down one's life does not necessarily involve dying. Of the 13 million uh, American men and women in uniform in World War II, only 1 million died. It's a high death rate if compared with normal middle-class American life but very acceptable in the light of the actions and the results that gave us 12 million more veterans. 
then compare our losses with the enormous loss of life in the German, Russian, and particularly the Japanese military. But joining, taking that oath, putting on that uniform, doing basic training, then advanced and specialized training, going where the brass tell you to, and doing what they say is the epitome of laying down your life. It doesn't mean dying necessarily. It's told in the book of Genesis, Isaac laid down his life on the hastily built altar in obedience to his father Abraham, who was himself acting in obedience to what God commanded in the first ever draft call, if you will. And he didn't die, and neither did us who lived to be veterans, thank God. As told in the book of Genesis, um, there, there is also another day to honor those who died serving, Memorial Day. This today is for Veterans Day. General George Patton said something like, you're not supposed to die for your country. You're to make the other uh, guy die for his country. I've cleaned it up somewhat from what Patton actually said and would have been saying uh, in his lingo. I think of many other veterans who served outstandingly, but thank God were not killed. They live to be veterans. I think in particular of Corporal, then Corporal Alvin York. He was a drunken, violent man until a close friend was killed alongside him in a drunken bar brawl. York responded in deep grief, accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and became an active member of his mother's church, answering her prayers for him to be sober and a pacifist. He was drafted in 1917 and applied for conscientious objector status, but refused it when it came and left for France in uniform. He did not want to shoot people, but snapped to reality and action. Some of his good friends were killed by a German machine gun nest, including his sergeant. In a rage, he leapt to the duty before him and used the gifts God had given him, leadership and marksmanship and took out the, the machine gun crew. Whereupon the remains of the German company, 132 German soldiers, nearly three platoons, surrendered to him and his, then the nine men left from his platoon with him. For this action, he received the Medal of Honor, the French Croix de Guerre and the equivalent award from our then ally, Italy. York was a very unusual man. Up through history and into World War I, only one or two men out of 10 would actually point their weapon at a man and pull the trigger to kill him. Only one in 10 men would do that. Patton knew that and said to his men in, um, okay, I know that only one of you is gonna shoot, but the other nine shoot at the ground in front of them. That'll scare them and, uh, and achieve the result we want. It was very insightful and uh, rather calm for Patton to say. For this action, um, York received the Medal of Honor, the French Croix de Guerre and the like. Uh, famously, a British soldier in World War I had Private Adolf Hitler in his sights and didn't kill him. People are reluctant to kill, despite what you might think from the many murder accounts in the newspapers. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Cross, uh, Grossman, an infantry officer who commanded a battalion in Vietnam, wrote a very important book, which is required reading in our service academies, officer candidate schools, FBI and police academies on killing goes into why this is so and shows how modern American soldiers are trained out of this reluctance. Think of a firing range with target or 50 or 100 meters away. The target has circles around a bullseye. And when you get the correct score, you graduate. But if that's all the training that you're given in shooting, it does not help in combat. 
our infantry, police, and FBI now get that initial training in weaponry at first. But the more realistic training is going through a field with pop-up man-sized targets, which drop when you hit them properly with a bullet. There is another system using videos and scenarios referred to as shoot, don't shoot, which is quite taxing with you actually yelling at videos, drop the weapon. And if he doesn't, you still have to decide whether it's correct to shoot the, sus the suspect with your laser pistol. This is far more realistic and prepares men so well that the actual firing rate in Vietnam was closer to 85% instead of 10%, an enormous increase in firing rates over our earlier wars. The same training was given the British soldiers who took back the Falkland Islands from the Argentines. The Argentinian soldiers had been given the usual training with circles to shoot at, but the British soldiers had begun their the more modern training and terrified the Argentinians. Uh, with their very accurate and far more plentiful and deadly rifle fire. This factor added to the rapidity with which the British retook the Falkland Islands. I perhaps have told you more than you cared to know about weapons training in the US military and law enforcement. This is significant though, because it means that there are far more of our soldiers who return with the pain of knowing that they kill not only a man, but maybe many men than in past wars. The moral injury our soldiers bring back home with them has led to many a suicide of our veterans uh, since Vietnam. In 2012 alone, an estimated 7,500 veterans died from suicide. That despite greatly increased suicide prevention programs and techniques. That's about two brigades of, of troops a year, a whole division in two years, killed by the memories of combat and being efficient about killing other people. There were and are many, many more who charged over the top, into the tunnel, across the field, into the tank, into the beach, out the aircraft door with backpack and rifle, to float down through fire from the enemy on the ground, to down into the ship or up onto the deck, into the turret, on the plane, right into anti-aircraft or hostile aircraft fire. It was Navy Lieutenant George H.W. Bush who continued to fly his dive bomber after being hit, right at the radio towers that allowed enemy command and control transmissions on the Japanese island of Shichijima to bomb them. This is the famous incident in which his plane went down and he bailed out to be rescued by an American submarine. These laid down their lives for their friends and lived, thankfully, but scarred by the utter terror of the moments. And many live on with post-traumatic stress syndrome, perhaps the rest of their lives. They live to be veterans. An important correction needs to be made here. Any rabbi will tell you that the original word in Hebrew, ratzak, in the sixth commandment, commandment in Exodus 20, verse 13, and Deuteronomy 5, verse 17, is not properly translated kill, as in thou shalt not kill. The proper translation of that Hebrew word is murder. You shall do no murder. The translators of the King James Version in 1611 got it wrong. And with the exception of the Revised Standard of 1951, every major translation since, including the new King James Version, has gotten it right. But thanks to 340 years of the wrong translation, it's solidly in the culture that the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Not so. And ironically, elsewhere in the Old Testament, God commands the Israelites to kill those in their way of retaking the promised land. So if the Bible is inerrant, as many conservatives maintain, this is an odd stance to take about not killing being one of the commandments. 
The implications of this mistranslation are still being fought out in discussions about capital punishment and warfare. Don't let anyone mislead you in any of those discussions. There may be valid reasons for not executing people or not going to war, but the sixth commandment is not one of them. I'm quite justified before God and Caesar in killing someone invading my house or country who might kill my family or me. But I'm forbidden by the Lord to murder you to get your pickup truck or your oil fields. And for us veterans and the other some 25 million veterans, we're observing Veterans Day. Some of us can remember when it was called Armistice Day, a title which was changed to honor the veterans from all wars. Additionally, I feel it's far more appropriate because the title Veterans Day honors the soldiers, sailors, airmen, uh, Marines and Coast Guardsmen, far greater majority of those who served in all wars from 1775 to the present day. In a way to call it Armistice Day, honors primarily the politicians and diplomats of 1918, who tried but failed to effectively end the war that was to end all wars in a way that the next world war would, would not have happened. To call it Armistice Day is to remember the failure of those um, of those who tried but failed to effectively end the war, such that the next world war would not have happened. To call it Armistice Day is to remember the failure of those English, French, and yes, American politicians who were determined to humiliate the Germans by onerous terms. They let their hatred of the Bosch get in the way of statesmanship, common sense, and Christian values of love for the neighbor. They guaranteed German vengeance and a warped sense of honor that easily produced World War II as soon as Germany had a new generation grown up. Schooled by demagogues building upon the economic chaos from the punitive requirements of the armistice peace plan. Contrast 1918 with the ending of World War II, 30 years later, in 1948, the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe did not allow the next generation of demagogues who were there ready to pounce, to stir up hatred at the victors and march against them yet again in another 20 years. Instead, I was in a discussion group in France with some Germans in the 1990s when one of them brought up the subject of that long ago Marshall Plan. It was not just, one German friend said. Oops, I thought, are we about to have an international discussion here? The German went on. No, the Marshall, the Marshall Plan was not just. It was grace. He went on. We Germans had started that terrible war and did horrible things to others. And afterwards, the Americans went into debt, rebuilding our country. It was pure grace. Grace begets miracles. Vengeance begets more and more vengeance. The veterans of World War I, of World War II, had their efforts rewarded appropriately by thoughtful peace terms and peaceful, graceful actions that eventually meant an end to wars within Europe. Consider how Europe had been a in a state of almost constant war for centuries. One can drive across Europe now without having to go through heavily armed checkpoints to get into another country. I remember giving profound thanks when our then 20 year old child went to study in France and not having to go there in a military uniform like my uncles did in World War I and World War II to put down the next demagogue since we'd pulled the rug out from underneath the boots of any possible demagogue wishing to gain power. I really can't remember whether I had to get out and show my passport driving into France from Germany or back into Germany or into Spain or Italy. It was such a non-event, I don't remember it. Grace brought about a lasting peace on that continent. 
may that same dedication to peace finally reign in the Middle East is my fervent prayer, as indeed it did in Ireland. So not only do all Americans <clears throat> salute Vance this day, but citizens of the many, many nations, many of you served and fought to free them from tyranny and or chaos on six of the seven continents salute you as well. I have a question, not necessarily a trivia question to ask. How many times do you think the US military has been sent out on a mission <clears throat> on behalf of peace? To clarify, I count World War II as one mission, even though there were tens of thousands of individual missions in that war. <clears throat> So how many? A dozen? Well, let's see. The Revolution, the War of 1812, the Civil War, the Indian Wars, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Persian Gulf I and II, and Afghanistan. A dozen. But the real answer is a dozen dozen. And more times, men and women in American uniforms have become veterans serving peace in one place or another, hardly trivial. Places like Tripoli, Marines will remember that, Haiti a few times, Mexico a few more times, Panama twice, Nicaragua, Honduras, Colombia, Cuba, China, even Russia in 1919. The Philippines, Somalia, Bosnia, Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan, and on and on and on about 150 times, according to a US military book of lists that I bought in the base exchange of Quantico, which listed every one of them by incident and date. An impressive list. May the people of all, from all cultures coming to these shores live up to the American ideals of a just and honorable peace. And in Jefferson's word, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Far too many people have fought and a significant number of them died for those ideals. Patriots willing to lay down their lives and very bodies in the grave to ensure our freedoms and those of others. God rest their souls and give long life, joy, peace, and his love to the rest of us, veterans and citizens, and bring peace to those veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. Enough said about veteran state. Let's explore a fascinating aspect of serving in combat. As you're aware, many have died in combat serving. What's delightful is that our modern military medicine has resuscitated very many men and women after their deaths in combat, bringing them back complete with near-death experiences which too few of them have shared. One Vietnam vet whose near-death account I came across decades ago, thanks to the Enderf uh, website, the um, Near Death Experience Research Foundation, founded by Jeff and Jody Long, um, is covered in my book, Revealing Heaven, The Christian Case for Near Death Experiences. Here's my book. You can get it on any of the internet sites by going to John W. Price and look for it. I'm the only John W. Price they think has ever published a book. Um, he was one of these guys, the guy that I found on the, uh, on the Endurf website. He was one of those guys enamored of his weapons, ferocious ability to destroy bodies, blowing away sides of heads, blowing off arms and spreading intestines all over the place. As he put it, he was just popping gooks. They all looked alike to him, wearing those black pajamas. Then a mortar shell landed near him. Suddenly, he realized he was walking along in a deep ditch filled with blood, guts, limbs, and other body parts. He looked up, and on the ridge of the, of the ditch on both sides, were all the people he had killed, missing heads, sides of heads, arms, all pointing at him as best as they could, screaming and cursing at him. 
he said it was horrifying experience. Suddenly he was out of there, back on the ground, being resuscitated by an army medic who uh, gave him plasma CPR after plugging the holes in him, which had made him quickly bleed out. He changed and became deeply concerned for everyone around him. The last I heard, he turned his life around. We're also painfully aware of the combat conditions on our city streets. At night, in some sections of large cities uh, with gang warfare underway, fueled by family breakdowns and teens looking for comradeship and safety from the other violent gangs. One friend of mine an elderly, gentle professor at the University of Houston was walking his dog one late one evening when a car jumped the curb, hit the dog and him, breaking both his legs. He was a long time recovering, lecturing from crutches in the University of Houston uh, classrooms. When he asked a Houston cop, what was that all, all of that about? He was informed it was most likely a gang initiation to find someone out walking and hit them with a car. So another friend, Justin, was in his late teens when he was walking home late at night on the streets of Houston. He saw a young man ahead of him being beat up by three other guys. He thought, that's no good. He and I could send those guys running. So he jumped in trying to rescue the one. Suddenly, the one getting beat up and the other three turned on the rescuer and began beating him up and stabbing him deeply with a screwdriver in many places. The beating he tried to interrupt was a gang initiation of the one guy. And Justin was um, uh, they found one, but of course the ER was on, well, the friends arrived, chased off the four, put Justin in their car and sped off, trying to find a hospital with an emergency room. They found one, but of course the ER was on the other side of the large hospital. By the time they got him around to the ER, he had bled out. The ER team quickly resuscitated him with plasma and what was learned in Korea and Vietnam. The Army sends its medics, you may not know this, in training at, from Brook Army Medical Center to level one trauma centers in various cities around Texas to learn how to deal with such combat wounds from the city streets firsthand. Justin's experience on the other side before he was resuscitated showed him how much of his teen years uh, activity was off from what he learned he should be doing. So he has reworked his life and considers his near-death experience a good one to show him how uh, so much about how he should live. He's a neat guy. I turn out to be the first person he's discussed his experience with in depth and the great change in his life as a result. Dr. John Graham, president of the Institute for Spirituality and Health, part of the Texas Medical Center here in Houston, read my book and asked me to be on a panel discussion with Dr. Jeff Cripple, professor of comparative religions at Rice University to discuss near-death experiences. And as we were getting ready for it, he, uh, Dr. Graham asked, can you bring someone who's had the experience? I said, how many would you like? He said, just one, we don't have the time for more. So I said, I know just who I'll bring. She is Elizabeth Crone, who contacted me excitedly when I was on television and in the newspapers discussing my book back when it was first published. She had stopped in the parking lot of her synagogue in a thunderstorm when she stepped out with an umbrella to shelter her two small sons. She was killed by a lightning bolt that hit the metal pole in, the, in, it, in its center, burned the shoes off her feet. The two boys ran running, screaming into the synagogue where they ran right into their uncle. The uncle looked for his sister-in-law and saw her lying on the ground in a puddle of water, smoking. He bellowed into the synagogue, we need a doctor. As she put it, 40 doctors piled out of that synagogue and the first one to uh, tour knew just what to do. The diaphragm and heart had been paralyzed by the shock. So he administered CPR and resuscitated her. 
When she got out of the hospital, she tried to tell her rabbi about being with the Lord, sitting on a bench, learning she was pregnant, would have a little girl who would be named such and such, who would become a nurse. Her husband would divorce her um, after she told him about this experience. It was time for Elizabeth to go back. When she tried to tell her rabbi after getting out of the hospital, he wouldn't listen to the story and dismissed her. Her husband divorced her, so she went quiet about the experience for 20 years until she came across my book. She met a new husband who um, was in bed with her one night at 2.30 a.m. when the phone rang. She answered it and was stunned. It was her grandfather, dead for a couple of years. The husband heard the following conversation. The grandfather was calling to tell her that her mother was trying to find an important document, but couldn't find it. I've been trying to tell her, but she can't hear me. So you tell her it's in such and such a location. And now this is exhausting and I've got to stop the call. Click. At this point, Dr. Cripple, the professor of comparative religions, got up and said, yes, yes. There are two books out on this subject of after-death communication um, through electronic means. The first instance, he said, was a telegram in 1913. Ironically, Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone, was also what was called a spiritualist in the day attending seances and the like to, uh, to contact the dead and tried in his lifetime to develop a, an electronic uh, in instrument like his telephone that the dead could call on. And he went to his death not knowing that he'd invented it. Uh, here is one of the, uh, those two books, Dead Men Talking, Afterlife Communication from World War I. I'll read a portion of it. The background to this is that this young man had learned the joys of using a um, telegraph key and, and learning Morse code and sending messages. He had an early uh, transmitting radio and, uh, and he taught his mother Morse code so that they could communicate back and forth. Then he was drafted into the army in 1917 and went off to France. One evening after he was over there, um, she heard the uh, code for answer the phone. It's the letters C and Q, pronounced CQ, seek you. Well, so she got on and she recognized that this was her son. Now I read from the book. Mother be game. I'm alive and loving you, but my body is with thousands of other mother's boys near lungs. Get this fact to others if you can. It's awful for us when you agree and we can't get in touch with you to tell you we're all right. This is a clumsy way. I'll figure out something easier. I'm confused yet, Bob. So the mother goes on. So the news that my son had been killed came to me from his own intelligence by the methods we'd used together in our experiments here in this very room. And as I'm transcribing it, he told me to do all for all to see who can be convinced of its sincerity. Uh, a month later, official notice of Bob's death on the battlefield was received by the mother. She realized that Bob's first wireless message to her came not long after he fell. Before then, however, the mother had already received several additional wireless messages. The second one, Bob communicated, attention, get this across. There's no horror in death. I was one minute in the thick of things with my company. And the next minute, Lieutenant Wells touched my arm and said, our command is crossed, let's go. I thought he meant the river and followed him under the crossfire barrage the Tommies made up to a hillside that I had not noticed before. 
clean spot, not blackened by the guns. Lots of fellows I knew were there and strange troops, but they looked queer. I looked down at myself. I was all in drab, all in drab, all right, but my uniform was not khaki. It seemed to be a fabric of more tenuous kind. I had no gun. I overtook Wells, Lieutenant. What in the deuce is the matter with us? Uh, I asked. He said, Bob, we're dead. And uh, when we marched through the German barbed wire barricades in front of the howitzers, I realized that the body that could be hurt had been shed on the red field. Then I thought of you, sent the wireless from an enemy station in the field. The officer in charge couldn't have seen me, but he heard, I guess, by the way his eyes popped, he sent a few shots in my direction. You can imagine the German officer hearing the, key, the uh, uh, telegraph going and speaking in English. And he, what is this? I carefully said of combat near-death experiencers, too few of them have shared their accounts. Many don't, and I'll get into that later. Here's one from a Vietnam vet that was given to me by um, Indurf, uh, from a Vietnam vet, Bill Vanden Bosch Bush. In 1969, Bill was in a squad, about nine men searching for a downed helicopter. Suddenly they came under fire from the Viet Cong, the South Vietnamese local communist guerrillas, the enemy. I'll explain things the civilians listening in won't understand otherwise. Obviously the Viet Cong knew the chopper was down, so other Americans would come looking for them for rescue and recovery. One of the difficult things for our soldiers about the Vietnam War was that the Viet Cong did not have uniforms like the North Vietnamese Army. Instead, they were just peasants wearing the typical black shirt and pants rather resembling pajamas. What made that all the more difficult for our soldiers was that most of the Vietnam men, whether Viet Cong or simply South Vietnamese civilians, wore the same black PJs. Kind of like going out in the towns and countryside of Texas and seeing men wearing a denim shirt, blue jeans, and a Stetson type hat or a baseball cap. You can't tell one from the other by their clothing. Except in Vietnam, the Viet Cong in black PJs would probably be carrying AK-47s or a captured M16 or some such assault weapon and shooting at you if he saw you first. Sergeant Bill Vandenbush was correcting, was directing squad fire at the Viet Cong who had them pinned down. Bill had the radio man call in the location of the Viet Cong firing at them. But of course, the transmission got garbled and Bill's own position was given over the radio instead of the Viet Cong's. Bill's squad was blown up. His eye was blown away along with other grievous wounds. It was misdirected friendly fire. Suddenly Bill was in peace, joy, love and happiness with his grandfather greeting him who took him into nothing but goodness. And suddenly another ball of energy with authority said, it's not your time, go back. At the right moment, the situation worsened, reversed. A medical evacuation helicopter called a medevac took him and other casualties back to a forward aid station. At some point in all this, he was resuscitated. Bill was flown out of Vietnam to months of recovery and he was released from service to what developed at first into years of aimless searching. After being asked to talk about his near-death experience to a local group studying such things in the Seattle area, which at first really frightened him, he quickly found his voice and courage to speak out in meetings with the groups associated with the various International Association for Near-Death Studies around the country and on YouTube videos. He's found his calling, helping others to know the deeply loving white light that he encountered. To help others find a peaceful, caring, loving, giving light. 
Bill teaches that all that we all have a purpose for being here. At this point, civilians need to know something about military culture and one's health, particularly spiritual, psychological health. The last thing you want to do in the military is have some hair-raising story too many people won't understand attached to you, particularly if it might indicate you've lost your mind or are psychotic, brain damaged, or hallucinating. It might very well get into your personnel file and wreak havoc on your career. It might adversely affect your annual finish fitness report if your raider doesn't understand the powerful effect an NDE has on someone for the better. This is not only across the military, but in the FBI as well. A sad example of the uh, effect of talking openly about a spiritually transformative event is to be found in the account of the the out-of-body experience of Chief Petty Officer Tony Woody, flight engineer, had in a Navy jet. Well, it came far too close to a terrible, fatal uh, landing accident. He describes his unfortunate experience with his career and later the Veterans Administration on this subject in several videos on YouTube, talking about what absolutely wonderful things he learned about God during his extensive out-of-body experience or OBE, and how it ended his career. He gets rather effusive talking about it. Anything like a near-death experience back in 1969 for Bill Vandenbosch, Van Vandenbush, is even now, sadly, not at all understood or appreciated in the military. The term NDE wasn't even developed by Dr. Raymond Moody for another six years when it was first used in his book, Life After Life. Happily, his book sold many tens of millions of copies, and he's written several since, exploring deeper aspects uh, of the NDE. More people do know about NDEs, but lots of people still don't know, understand, or accept them, uh, and are very reluctant to even be open-minded about it. I find that opposition is shrinking quickly. There's more and more books, magazine articles, and churches are holding meetings to discuss the subject. Keep it up. People need to know. I'll give you an example. I was the acting division chaplain for the 49th Armored Division in 1976 and at Fort Hood for my two weeks annual training. The chief of staff called me in to help a, uh, deal with a soldier in a jam. He'd fallen off a tank and had a, it broken his leg. It was just a green stick fracture of his femur. The Army hospital had kept him for observation for a week and released him. Army surgeons can give orders for the care of a patient being released that the brass has to obey. This soldier was to be taken home, not to return to light duty with the National Guard. He could not go home in a convoy with his walking cast. And the chief of staff said, I don't know what to do, chaplain. I replied, I know what to do, Colonel. He won't fit in my Toyota Corolla, but he'll fit in your Ford LTD. Give me the keys to your car, Colonel. We were friends, so I could get away with that. He did. I gave the keys to my driver and told him to bring the big white Ford on the other side of the wall to where the soldier was. I trotted over to him, whom I didn't know. He was easily spotted, the only guy wearing a walking cast on his whole leg. I told him I was gonna drive him home to San Antonio in accordance with his surgeon's orders. I carried his duffel bag to the trunk, helped him into the back seat so that he could stretch out his leg. And he was so impressed that a chaplain, a major, was taking such care of him that he decided to share his story with me. He told about his sniffing glue and paint in elementary school, marijuana in junior high, and going on to the hard stuff in high school. He dropped out of school and moved to California for the drug scene. One night he took a pill someone gave him and said it was the worst trip he'd ever had, painful, terrifying, but suddenly he was at peace in no pain. He, just, he described going through a tunnel with a buzzing sound. He didn't claim to have died, but at this point I was stunned and realized this was the sort of thing that Raymond Moody had talked about in his book, 
life after life that I had just read the previous month. You see, I've been raised in my family to become a mechanical engineer. by A very skeptical father with the authority of a PhD. He regularly scoffed at what were called spiritualists back in his uh, early years, people conducting seances to communicate with the dead. So I was not inclined to believe the first woman in my parish in 1970 to try to tell me about her experience while clinically dead. It really didn't help that she was the sort of person who would tell you anything to get your attention. That winter, Dr. Raymond Moody published his bestseller book, Life After Life, which I just read the previous month before going to Fort Hood. And this soldier, whom I call Private Alberto in my book, um, was the first person to tell me his stunning experience with temporary death that I listened to with rapt attention because he was so innocent and forthcoming about his being his personal experience. He told me about suddenly being with a dude made of light at the end of the tunnel. And there were all his dead family and friends greeting him in love. <clears throat> he was then shown his life in great detail. Like on a big TV screen. He was shown that when he was sniffing glue and paint, smoking marijuana in junior high and dropping out of school to pursue a life in drugs, that he was throwing the gifts that God had given him back in the face of God and that this was wrong for him. Alberto woke up in his body and his buddies were standing over him, patting him on the face, saying, hey man, you scared us. Your skin turned gray, your eyes were restricted and fixed and you weren't breathing. He got up and walked away cold turkey from drug addiction. He went back to San Antonio, apologized to his parents, got back into high school, graduated from high school, joined the Texas Army National Guard where I was blessed to meet him a couple of years later. When I make the point in my book that those who've had NDEs need to talk about it, it's not only for their own benefit to fully understand what happened to them, um, but for others to hear the story and realize these things are real and to learn a lot about the peace of death and that it is nothing to be feared. My book on all of this is sold well. I've now visited with 400 NDEers and more people who've had the experience and helped a lot of them understand just what happened. Be at peace. And that's my talk. Okay, so everybody, we can just give them a hand. We can't hear everybody, but we do appreciate that presentation. Um, I, I do, thank you, Reverend Price. I want to just share the uh, with the others that I met Reverend Price at a conference when I first started exploring and seeking insight into spiritual experiences. I was drawn to this really tall guy. Now you got to understand, I'm a tall Texan that got cheated. <laughs> and um, but he, was, he was wearing a collar, but I quickly found myself talking to a person of wit and a sense of humor. When I discovered he was a fellow Texan and willing to talk about spiritual experiences, I felt comforted. I knew I had a battle buddy, somebody I could lean on, somebody I could talk to. We have managed to meet up at several other conferences since then. So I'm looking, uh, we don't really have any questions. So yet, if you have one, go ahead and put it in your chat box. And Reverend Price, I I'm gonna give you a leading question here. I see a picture over your right shoulder. Um, or do you have a photograph of yourself in uniform? You didn't wear your collar when you went out in the field, did you? No, I did not wear my collar. That would be out of uniform. Uh, <laughs> British chaplains get to wear a collar if they're a priest. But uh, no, no, for me, uh, the only thing it said chaplain was a cross on my lapel. You have a picture of you somewhere in here. Do you, do you find no, I, yeah. my wife is offering her, uh, her iPhone to uh, my iPhone to find a picture of me. No. 
Okay. <laughs> um, well, okay, I do have a question. This is from Yvonne. And she asked, have you heard any stories of military personnel having after death communications with their fallen comrades? And I know you talked about some, uh, two examples in there. One was in World War I. Uh, at, do you have more recent material on after death communications and how, how does it help no. the veteran afterwards? I mentioned um, Elizabeth Crone and Dr. Cripple. She's talking about some military. The two of them got together and wrote this book and it includes her story about her grandfather calling her dead grandfather in the middle of the night. She wants to know military. I know, she wants to be, she wants a story about military. I'd love to hear it, but I haven't heard one. I'm sure that this sort of thing happens. Um, okay. Um, I do have a long one here, so everybody bear with me. This is from Charles. On what is known as Remembrance Day by our friends and comrades in arms and democracy in our North, let us recognize the tremendous contributions to peace made by the soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Canadian Armed Forces. Since World War II, Canadian forces have participated in combat operations in Korea during the Korean War, yes, in the indeed. provinces of the former Yugos Yugoslavia and Gulf Force, World War I and II, and Afghanistan. Canadian forces have been engaged in peacekeeping operations around the world in Cyprus, the Belgium, Longo, Sinai Desert, Golan Heights, Lebanon, Rwanda, and Timor. Certainly our closest and most cherished friends and allies. That's true. Our brothers across the border in Canada also have a tremendous military force and a great deal of veterans. Right. Canadians were into World War II before we were by a long shot, and World War I. Huh. Okay. I was going to supplementing that dialogue, the question about after death communications. We did have Dr. Botkins, Alan Botkins, speak at a previous conference, and he has a process of inducing after death communications, and he came about it in a roundabout way, but he um, used it to help veterans. He had sessions with over 3,000 veterans using after death communications, and many times it helped them alleviate the cause of their PTSD because they were able to communicate either with somebody, a close comrade that had died and or somebody they had killed in the line of duty. And uh, so it was very, his book is very good. It's, it's called Induced After Death Communications. And it's a pretty extensive program. We tried to get it in with the VA to try to formalize a program, but as yet that's been unsuccessful. Um, okay, I get another one. No more questions, folks. I may well have answered all the questions anybody would have thought of. I felt it was a very insightful uh, to know a little bit more of the history and the 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 redefinition of the word in the Bible about thou shalt not kill to be in thou shalt not murder. I think that would give a lot of soldiers peace. I'm not sure that new translation has been well known or publicized. And I know I work with the disabled American veterans and we have PTSD therapy groups. I'm gonna be sharing that with our therapist that comes to, this, to the chapter. It's and, very uh, worthwhile. The, uh, I'll tell you a uh, military chaplain medic story. I was at the first ever um, conference of chaplains, military chaplains, and medical military doctors. This was at the uh, Brook Army Medical Center where they train the medical doctors to be army doctors. And um, they had about a three-day conference for us, which was very nice. Lots of 
scenarios to work through. And one uh, told about a real incident in, in uh, the Korean War that uh, it was well known that when the North Koreans or the Chinese later came through and overran a uh, allied medical station, that they would come running in, their soldiers would come running in with bayonets and they would kill the patients who were still there with their bayonets, which is a horrible, horrible way to die. And um, so the question was, you're a medical officer in a forward aid station, and you know that you're dealing with a communist country that doesn't have the same uh, morals and ethics that we do, and they're going to bayonet your patients that can't be uh, carried out. What will you do? And of course, some of the medics said, well, in a, uh, in a terrible situation like that, we can give an overdose of morphine to kill. And this one chaplain, whom I had seen around but didn't know, stood up and said, wait a minute. No, 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 that's always wrong. It, the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. I stood up and said, we have a rabbi here. Rabbi, pointing to the rabbi I knew. Would you please tell us what is the Hebrew word in that particular passage in Genesis and Deuteronomy? And he said, Ratzak. And I said, will you please give us a proper translation of that word? How is it translated into English correctly? And he said, murder. You shall not murder. I said, this is um, something that I learned in seminary, is that the original word is not whatever kill would have been, but ratzak, which means murder. And in the earliest prayer books of the Anglican Communion, the, uh, there was a patient, there's a section in which the um, Ten Commandments is listed off and we're to read it. And at the Sixth Commandment, it reads in those prayer books, you shall do no murder. And that's the way it is in every Anglican Book of Common Prayer of, around the Anglican Communion. Um, that it, and the Bible translations that we use now, the new recent, revised standard version, uh, it's, it's translated correctly there. The two that are not accurate that I know of is, of course, the King James, which first messed it up. And then the uh, revised standard version in 1951, which continued the mistake. But the revised King James, the new King James version, ha has, it, has it translated correctly. As, do, as does um, the New English Bible and the New Revised Standard Version and all the others. I have a stack of Bibles in the next room <laughs> that has this. And there are only two that are wrong is the King James and the 1951 Revised Standard. Okay, well, you've, I'm sure you have a much better resource library than I do on that. We do have a few more questions coming up. Yes, good. Okay, so we've got again from Yvonne. Have you found that veterans can have both PTSD and an NDE? Have any shared any um, having both type of experiences? The way it's put, I have not found, I've not come across someone with PTSD and a near-death experience. I would think that a near-death experience um, would cure PTSD um, because of the peace and the complete understanding that someone gets of the Lord's ways uh, in a near-death experience. That would be my guess. I'd love to meet somebody who had had PTSD and then had an NDE. The other way around, whichever order things happen to him, I would be willing to bet because of the the peace that people find through a near, near death experience uh, would cure PTSD. Now, having said that, for God's sakes, if you have PTSD, don't go commit suicide. <laughs> 
because what I've also found with people who commit suicide and, and uh, um, others who, who talked about this can, can back me up on this. Um, instead of going to Hawaii, it's like you go to West Texas. Bleak, featureless, plain of an experience uh, and still aware of all the problems that drove you to suicide and also aware and being unable to do anything about them and being aware of the pain and grief that you brought to your family and friends at your suicide. So suicide is not an answer to problems. Um, stick it out and, and deal with it better and, and, um, and get some help. But if you've got PTSD, suicide is not a good answer. I would like to expand on that a little bit also in that we have a speaker on November 21st. If you go to our events page, um, where an individual, he's a civilian, not a veteran, but he had an, an NDE profound and he kept trying to share it with people and the rejection of his account over and over and over sure. stimulated what he calls his PTSD because the, what was a reality to him was being denied by so many people. Right, exactly so, which is why people with an NDE, not only do they need to be able to talk about it, to for fully understand what happened, because I've talked to lots of people who had had it and never dealt with it, and, it, and the discussions that we had helped them enormously um, to understand what's going on in their lives. Um, give you an example. I'll give you an example. I talked about Elizabeth Crone. She called me frantically about three months after my book came out because she just discovered my book in, uh, in me and the television interview that I had and uh, in the newspapers. So we had a four hour lunch in which she told me about various problems. And during the lunch, I looked at her wrist and I saw that there was no wristwatch. Clue, there was a Fitbit. And I said, and how is that Fitbit uh, serving you? And she said, not well at all. This is my third one. They keep wearing out on me. I said, no, they didn't wear out on you. You wore them out because you have come back from your near-death experience with a um, electromagnetic field around you and it runs down the batteries and that's what's happening. Give it up. You'll ruin every Fitbit ever made if you keep going through this. Um, and there are other, there are other, some of them are difficulties, some of them are usable gifts <laughs> that some NDEers come back with. For example, Seeing auras around people of different colors that have to do with the uh, character of the person. I was walking down the street and a policeman came trotting over to me and said, I want to meet you. You're a fascinating person. And I thought, what is this? And I was not dressed like this. Um, I was just walking from my house down to Whole Foods. And uh, uh, I, th I thought, what is this? And he said, no, no, no. I want to, uh, I need you to go down and get the battery charger because this thing is now down to low percentage. And um, uh, I said, I thought, what is this? And he said, no, 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 I want to meet you. You're a fascinating person. And uh, I said, well, I've introduced myself. And uh, he said, something told me book, tell him about the book. So I told him about my book. And he said, that's it. I had the experience. Oh, really? He told me his experience. And we talked about that. And um, um, then I said, well, how did you know to talk to me? that I'm a fascinating person. He said, sir, it's your aura. I said, really, you see my aura? Yes, he said, it's a beautiful aura, um, quite a compliment. And um, 
I said, you see them in different colors, don't you? He said, I do, but as a policeman, the auras that fascinate me the most are people with black auras um, because it gives away their character. And if he keeps an eye on them long enough, why uh, they act out of the black aura nature and um, they, um, they, then he can arrest them. There are no laws against having a black aura, but it's the type of behavior. He has the highest arrest record in his department of, oh no. Okay, well, John, what I'd like to do is give you just one more question that came up, or two maybe. Um, Get me have any of the veterans you encountered mentioned the term Valhalla as a place they were at during their NDE? I saw that question and no, Valhalla was not a term that they used. Okay. That's not and... to say that there aren't some that, that say that. That's a cultural incident and people will talk about their culture a lot. Uh, I've visited with um, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, and they have varying um, answers about what their experience was. And I've run across, bring it over here, please. You better tell me what you're doing. I'm having to uh, uh, get a uh, power supply for my computer. The battery's running down. Okay. And if you pull that bottom light, that bottom wire, the light will go off. Okay, pull it off. That's it. Put this in. And then we'll be back in business. Got it. Okay. I'd okay. like to jump to um, this question from Tamara. And it says, wondering if you've ever counseled veterans from, the, from World War II if, and if so, did they ever share an NDE story? And what differences in the NDEs, if any, have you heard from veterans of different war eras? The quick war. answer is no. I have only visited with Vietnam um, veterans. Okay. And uh, I'll be right back. Okay. I really have to go. <laughs> Uh, while he's absent, Robert, could you maybe give us a little insight into our presentation coming on November 21st? Uh, Got to get you unmuted. Try talking. Oh, Jeff is best. Can you hear me? Now we can. We got you now. I would love to. Uh, first of all, I'll just go ahead and put this out there while while, while Reverend Price is, is uh, not here right at the moment, but SAI would like to thank him for his presentation. I thought it was awesome. And, and we'd also like to thank um, his co-sponsor, Dr. Jeffrey Long and his uh, Ender organization. Thank you for the, for all the effort you put into it, Dr. Long. It was uh, that was one of the greatest intros I've ever seen anybody ever ever give anybody. And, and thank you for that. Um, November twenty first, we're going to go across the pond, and Raymond O'Brien uh, is going to be our uh, guest presenter. And he's fascinating. I think you'll really enjoy him. Uh, a seer and near death is his topic. So, whoop, Reverend Price is back. So, back Thanks. to you. <laughs> okay. Well, we almost made it to the end anyway. We, I do have... Um, one more question for you. And this was from Yvonne, or just a comment. In yoga, um, um, hinsa or nonviolence is translated as do not have the desire to do harm to others. We are fully entitled to defend ourselves. 
our families and our countries. So that pretty much coincides with what you are sharing. Sure. And uh, yes, I think that's a probably a universal concept across all the different cultures. <clears throat> I interestingly on the subject of uh, warriors talking about Valhalla. Uh, one of the interesting groups that I spoke to um, about the near-death experiences was in Oklahoma. Uh, it was a group of social workers and a significant number of the social workers were Native Americans who had had the near-death experience. And um, whenever I go to a group, I ask how many of you had near-death experiences? And quite a few hands went up. And I said, please uh, talk about this. And some of them uh, talked about their near-death experience, uh, including cultural aspects of being a Native American. And um, um, I've found that people are greeted by the ones that mean the most to them. Uh, quite a few Christians say that uh, Jesus greeted them. Interesting story about that is that um, um, when Colton Burpo had his near-death experience with a bad um, uh, appendix operation, he went back to his father's church because his father was a pastor of a um, Wesleyan church there in Nebraska. And as he walked through, he saw various paintings purporting to be Jesus. And the little boy said, that's not Jesus. And then um, um, he saw the painting done by the Ukrainian woman that grew up in this country of uh, uh, Jesus. And he got all excited. He said, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's who was there. So I later put that picture of Jesus on um, some of the Facebook pages of near-death experiences. And I said, for those of you who saw Jesus during your, your uh, near-death experiences, is this who you saw? And half of them said, yes, yes, yes. That's who I saw. Well, the painting very accurately shows a Middle Eastern man, whereas some of the other paintings of Jesus are not really a Middle Eastern man. So we have that to go on. Um, Arlene, where's my cell phone? Can you? Let's see if we can see this. Thank you. I have a copy of that painting in my uh, what? in my cell phone. As a as oh, is that too bright? That's there's, perfect. That's perfect. There's this painting, and uh, I have that around in a number of pages places. And that's the one that the little boy said, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. I agree with that. The book uh, that Kobe Todd talks about is the boy who went, who went to heaven. So I'll add that to the book list. We did have a number of people, uh, at least one person asked for a list of the books that we uh, mentioned tonight. And John, I'll get with you for the full title of the ones you were referencing. Um, I am going to share a little bit more about John also and let folks know just how grateful we need to be to have him with us tonight. Uh, John is a cancer survivor and he's finished his last treatment, I think in the last 60 days. So yes. Uh, and in the last three years, I think it was three years ago, he had a heart attack and how grateful he was that there was an IED at the facility he went, where he went down and he told me he questioned why he didn't have an NDE. And I think I got a clear impression 
You didn't need the lesson. You've gotten it already. And we are so grateful to have you with us. That is what PMH Atwater told me too when I asked her at the IANS conference that I didn't need the introductory course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, last call for questions. And I don't see that. So, um, Robert, I'm going to let you go ahead. Rob John, again, thank you so much for being with us. And I'm going to let Robert bring this session to a close. Thank you, Linda. Got to unmute Robert. Unmute Robert. There we go, right. Robert. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank everybody for attending uh, this presentation. It was wonderful, Reverend Price. Thank you so much for all the effort you put into it. And I'm going to turn it over to Yvonne, Dr. Kason, to finish and complete the, the presentation. So on behalf of uh, Spiritual Awakenings International, I want to uh, thank you, Reverend Price, for the wonderful presentation today, our inaugural presentation of the Veterans, Military, and First Responders Program. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. And we will see you all hopefully on November 21st, which is our next uh, Spiritual Awakenings International Presents events for uh, uh, Raymond O'Brien, a seer and oh. near death. So oh, I will now say- It's very appropriate that you, Dr. Kason, are uh, running this and, and invited me to participate because for Veterans Day, because in the army, kind of the army song is, may the caissons go marching along. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with that note, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, adios, au revoir, au revoir, buenos tardes, arrivederci, and ciao. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye, till next time.